Cashflow Diary Podcast, episode 569. Welcome to yet another exciting episode of the Cashflow Diary Podcast. The podcast that teaches you insider tips, tactics, and strategies for creating leveraged streams of cash flow into your life. Learn from top performing entrepreneurs, business owners, investors, and thought leaders from across the globe as they share their secrets to success. Like what you learn on this and other Cash Flow Diary podcast episodes? Go to learninvestingnow.com and sign up to receive powerful tips and information that will help you succeed as an entrepreneur and investor. Now, here's your host, investor, entrepreneur, business owner, educator, speaker, author, and master facilitator of Robert Kiyosaki's cash flow game. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome Jay to another episode Massey. of the Cash Flow Diary Podcast. I'm your host, Jay Massey, and I'm glad that you are here today because one of the best things that I have learned being in business is, well, I don't know everything. And not knowing everything necessitates that I go learn many things from many different individuals and the best individuals, in my opinion, to learn things from are those who have already been there, who have already done that, and most importantly, are willing to share what they've learned. And I have with me today one such entrepreneur. Many of you may already know him. I am, of course, speaking about Francis Greenberger. He's the legendary real estate developer who is chairman and CEO of Time Equities and owner of the literary agency Sanford J. Greenberg Associates. Now, just with those two things, I'm already intrigued. How does real estate and a literary agency even go together? What on earth makes those two work and how does that story even begin to develop what that suggests to me is that you and i we we have a lot that we can learn and most importantly what happens to a person an entrepreneur that changes them that molds them that helps them to grow to become a person who not only is someone recognized in business but in their community for doing the right things these and many more or I are things that I believe that you will learn today. So let's get ready to listen, love, and learn from Mr. Francis Greenberger. Francis, how are you doing? Good. How are you doing, Jay? So far, so good. I am intrigued uh, by everything that you have done and uh, curious to, to know to know a lot. Now, before I get too far down that road, well, because this is the first time that you're here today uh, on the show, I, what I would love to do is uh, I got to ask you the same question I tend to ask everybody else. You ready? Sure. Okay. I tend to look at today's entrepreneurs a lot like yesterday's superheroes, like, you know, Superman, Batman, Incredible Hulk, etc. because I think entrepreneurs and superheroes have a ton of things in common. For example, as an entrepreneur, occasionally I can envision myself flying around town, using our products and services, and saving our customers one sale at a time. Also, though, like a superhero, an entrepreneur has a beginning. So if you think about Spider-Man, there was a time where he was just a kid going to school and trying to take some photos and take a girl out on a date. Then one day he gets bit by a spider, discovers that, hey, I have superhuman abilities. And now he has to choose whether to use them for good or for evil. So my question to you is, is, is simple, actually. Before you know, Art Omni, before the, the Greenberg Center for Social and Criminal Justice, before your, your new book, even, uh, Risk Game, before all of these things and more that you have done, what we want to know is, who is Francis Greenberger? Well, that's, a, that's an interesting question, and uh, I'll do my best to answer it, although <laughs> probably referring you to some of my friends would would uh, would be even more interesting mm. you know I, uh, I I grew up in New York City um, uh, my parents were kind of middle class but were my father was a solepreneur uh, and frankly struggled almost his whole life economically never making a significant amount of money or even just just getting by. Uh, we didn't have a television in our house till I was 10 years old. Um, but uh, I guess the first thing I was blessed with was parents who who liked 
who liked me and thought very highly of me. Hmm. So uh, that the the empowerment of uh, encouragement uh, uh, of helping me to develop self confidence, I think was a was a key ingredient in my er- early development. I also uh, think that I had uh, sort of unusual talent as a as a young person. I had sort of an instinct for business. Mm. I started working for my dad uh, uh, after school when I was 12 years old. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, and in fact, when I was 16, I left one of the most prestigious high schools in New York because I wanted to work during the day and I went to school at night. So I was, uh, I was very motivated, uh, but I was also, I had some innate qualities that uh, um, gave me the, uh, um, the early characteristics and motivations to become a, an entrepreneur. I've said recently, for instance, that, that if you don't like risk, you shouldn't be an entrepreneur. And some people don't. So uh, um, I think that's one of the characteristics that I had and and perhaps other share with other entrepreneurs. Got it. I definitely we're going to dig in on the concept of risk here in, in just a second. But I just want to unpack and understand some things and definitely give it some context. You made a distinction that you didn't have a television in the house until you were 10. Is Was that uncommon? Uh, well, it was less, less uncommon than it would be today. Uh, this was the 1950s and, uh, our next door neighbor and friends fortunately had a television. Um, so when I wanted to watch TV, I went, went to their house. Uh, but I think, uh, in those days, uh, um, there were families like ours who, uh, couldn't couldn't afford a television and didn't have so when you look at the entrepreneurs today the i mean you've for all intents and purposes have been able to witness the impact of the television that it has had either on business and and society etc when you compare that to say the things of today cell phones social media etc do you see any parallels there well, certainly, I think in in the 1950s, uh, television became this extraordinary uh, medium of mass communication. Uh, I think the evolution of uh, of cell phones and and digital communication has changed uh, um, has has changed the nature of communication. Uh, and it's also, in a way, made it more personal hmm. um, because whether it's social media uh, or emails, um, I think there's a lot of inter inter uh, personal communication that's occurring, which is probably a good thing. And some people think there's too much interpersonal uh, <laughs> communication going on. It was interesting. I was at a uh, event the other night that was sponsored by Ericsson. Mm-hmm. a Swedish uh, uh, tech uh, conglomerate. Yes. And uh, they, the head of the company was there, and he said, you know, Ericsson's been in the communications business for 120 years or something, and uh, um, we look at human communication as one of the essential needs that, that people and human beings have. Hmm. Uh, and we've, in different ways from as as the world has evolved and technology has evolved, have looked to facilitate it uh, in, in 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 different uh, mediums, but that that basic uh, need of humans to communicate is at the core of what we do. And I thought that was an interesting comment on the significance of communication uh, to to humans, both individually as well as uh, from a societal point of view. Indeed, indeed. And yeah, it's, it's definitely changing. I like the, the concept of it being more personal for sure is is very much there. And then you also, I mean, if I remember your exact words, you said that you were blessed and fortunate to have 
parents that thought highly of you. And the, I don't know why that stuck out to me, but were there individuals that you were aware of whose parents didn't think highly of their children? No, but I'm I'm not particularly, although clearly there are people who have, have parents who are, are either not encouraging or or in many cases not present um i I remember uh, once i was watching a tennis match with a friend of mine who was a tennis promoter Mm -hmm. who ran the virginia slims tournament in new york the culminating women's event of, of the women's tour and we were looking at two players and he said to me you see those two players um there's no difference in their ability one of them was number one in the world at the time it was monica sellis I forget who number two was. He said, but the real difference is that the player who's going to prevail with between them is based on self-confidence. The player who has the most self-confidence will be the one who, who wins the match because, in fact, their skill level is very similar. And I was always uh, thought that that was important. And as I reflect back on my life and uh, um, particularly the role of mentors in my life, um, uh, I think those experiences, first and foremost, were all extremely empowering and gave me the confidence uh, to meet all the challenges that entrepreneurs often have to have to meet and uh, um, not be discouraged by. So in essence, then you're you would say self-confidence is one of those things that is a a difference maker, a game changer, a something that that gives an entrepreneur an edge. Yes, I would, and I think my friend was right in his observations, which, which I agree with. So, is that something then that you could put on? Would you consider that a skill? Is that something? Because it seems as though that that's something that can be outside of someone else's control, at least because the way that it seems that you you understood it or have come to understand it is because your parents thought highly of you. It helped you to develop self confidence. Is what if how would you say someone could do that in a different situation well I, in addition to my parents i've been blessed with several very very important mentors i see uh, in my life uh um, in my business life and um uh so i think the buy-in that one gets from mentors who one respects uh and an, and often are at a different point in their career uh can be very empowering and building of self-confidence. Got it. Totally understood. Now, <laughs> you said something that I think it, it, it's one of those four-letter words sometimes that, that people have challenges with, and the word is simply risk, because you, you said if you don't like risk, then you shouldn't be an entrepreneur. Now, being in the, the real estate space and the, the literary space, uh, some would say that you, you clearly love risk <laughs> i mean because they they they're fraught with both but what what i'm interested to know though is i don't think you perceive risk the way that many of us may have interpreted it before so i would love to understand what you consider risky so i i i have a term that i use which is intelligent risk okay so to me Intelligent risk is not, oh, I'm just going to take a flyer on something. <laughs> it's when we've fully investigated it, uh, we think we understand it, um, and we've drawn some conclusions uh, and, and see a path to success. Um, now, we may not be right, but we're not just doing something because we're hoping that things work out. We're doing it because we've looked at the market, understood the comparables we've understood uh, potentially the need for whatever product uh, we're offering um, and uh, um, we we see an opportunity to enter and be competitive in a marketplace that um, uh, others don't uh, ideally because I have a theory that if you go into um, a generic marketplace where you're just offering more of the same, uh, it's very, very hard as an entrepreneur to be competitive on p- price 
which is what you're left with if it's a if it's a field in which uh, um, there are a number of suppliers, um, and that's really the differentiating uh, characteristic. So I, I think that it's better to figure out where markets that people don't quite see or haven't uh, aren't addressing in the same way, mm -hmm. um, and try to find uh, um, solutions for uh, uh, to ad to address those unmet needs. So as it b pertains to the real estate marketplace at this moment, what would you say are some areas where people don't see or aren't addressing them the same way? Okay, I can give you lots of examples, but I'll start with one. Mm -hmm. Under-occupied office buildings. So these are office buildings which are, uh, for various reasons, might have seen their occupancy deteriorate to anywhere from 30 to 60 percent. Mm -hmm. Well, if you look at the marketplace for those office buildings, and let's say the average occupancy in that area, that region is 85 percent, you would rightly say, well, why is this office building at 50 percent when everybody else is at 85? And uh, um, uh, what you find out is that there might, might be some history with the building, for example, perhaps the former owners paid too much for it, had too big a mortgage, and couldn't meet that mortgage, and the building was going through foreclosure for a period of time. The old owners aren't willing to put new money in. Frankly, banks don't like to put money in, even if they're going to end up owning a property. And the building gets a bad reputation in the market. Brokers don't want to bring clients there because they're not being paid commissions. So they kind of... A and in the building, and uh, and people move out and nobody moves in. But it might be a perfectly reasonable uh, investment, uh, particularly because given its significant vacancy, you can buy it at a great discount from what a stabilized building would be selling for. So that's an opportunity to come in at a lower cost than the competitors, because often properties that are have been foreclosed or being sold under distress situations are priced uh, much lower than others. And uh, maybe the building needs some improvements. But ultimately, um, you would have, and your, because your cost basis is less, you can also rent for less. So these are all ingredients that make you very competitive in the market. And uh, hopefully, you'll be able to bring that building up to at least the average occupancy in the market and typically, that would be a, a very successful financial transaction. Agreed. Understood. Understood. Now, and and that makes sense. Um, is there, you know, what I, I'm curious to hear and know when, like, why real estate? Why was that the place for you? Hey guys, thanks for listening as always, and I'm glad that you continue to support with each and every download and subscription and share. One of the things that I want to ask you, though, is where are you listening to me from right now? I know some of you, maybe you're on a treadmill, maybe you're washing dishes, maybe you're walking that dog, and some of you are actually in a vehicle driving right now. One of the fun things that you can do, get some of your time back, is begin to living a car-free existence. But even then, it can be a little complicated. So one of the things that I want you to do is I want you to go over to Zipcar. Go to joinzipcar.com forward slash cash flow diary. It's a way that I am able to still go get a car just for a few hours very, very simply so that if I have a lot of errands to run and sheets to drop off and running to the short-term rentals or if I just want to go for a long trip up to LA and back, etc., I can rent a car for a very, very short period of time. And the cool part is I don't even have to pay for any gas. Again, go to joinzipcar.com forward slash cash flow diary. Well, uh, that's a good question because I was involved with my father's business, a publishing business, uh, starting out. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I, I have, have this memory of walking down Fifth Avenue in New York City Mm -hmm. when I was 14 or 15 and realized that visually 
I had cataloged a lot of the buildings in New York City. You could name a corner to me, and I could kind of tell you what the building looked like. <laughs> so I had this kind of innate sense of architecture uh, uh, and sense of the cityscape. Uh, and uh, um, I actually got into the real estate business as a byproduct of, of my my book business. Um, I rented an office that was too big for me and sublet half of it at double the rent I was paying. And the light went out, hey, maybe it's easier to make money in the real estate business than in the book business. <laughs> yeah, I can see that happening for sure. So uh, now there's a number of entrepreneurs who face, we'll call them headwinds in the sense that, you know, maybe their parents have an idea of what they should be doing or their spouse, or they just have family obligations and, and they would, they like the idea of real estate and they're doing something else today. So I'm curious to, to know, going from publishing to real estate, were there any particular headwinds? Did your dad like feel abandoned? Like, why are you not doing publishing? You're supposed to be doing real estate, uh, you, know, you know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, uh, and and he in fact uh, um, did wonder why I was leaving his business, and I I said to him, look, uh, um, you know, uh, I offered actually to build up his business because I thought it had potential, and bring in other people to work with him because he worked by himself. Mm. My mother assisted him, and I assisted him, but that was it, <laughs> and. Um, uh, and he said, oh, no, this is a personal service business. Only uh, I can do it or maybe you as my son could do it. But it's not a business where other people can can work from 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 our base. That's not what our clients are looking for. Hmm. Well, when he died, when I was 21 and I had at that point absented myself from his business for six years, I turned around and did exactly what I had suggested to him. And the literary agency still exists today. And there are about 25 uh, or more people who work there. And it's a very successful business in its industry. So, um, uh, um, you know, I, I just followed my own instinct. And of course, my main interest then turned out to be real estate, although for about 10 years, I did them probably 50-50. Wow, that had to be challenging. Just, I mean, the I'm, I'm just thinking about the number of hours that could be involved into because you're bringing assets to market, two different kinds of assets. Uh, but it takes a lot of work to give birth to an asset. Yeah, uh, you know, I've always been. I guess one of my other attributes, which I see in my youngest daughter, uh, I've always been a very hard worker. Hmm. Even even today, uh, you know. I'm usually at my desk at my home office until at six in the morning uh, and uh, do paperwork there and emails till, till maybe nine. Then I come to the office and put in a full day until six or seven. So I'm, I'm working a good 12, 13 hour day. And on weekends, I go home with a tremendous amount of homework and probably end up putting another at least 12 hours in over the weekend, if not more. So uh, I apparently like to work hard, uh, um, which is how I maybe was able to ride uh, two horses at the same time. Um, it seems natural to me. And I see my, my, my youngest daughter, I have four kids, but she's an incredibly hard worker. I went, remember once we went out to a play and we came home and it was pretty late at night. It was 11 or 11.30, I think it was Hamilton. And uh, I'm tired and going to bed. And I see her going into her study. And I said, well, where are you going, Claire? She says, oh, I have homework to do. So she was going to do homework from 11.30 at night till 1 or 2 in the morning. Uh, and, uh, you know, she was 15 or 16 at the time. So I think, uh, and incidentally, she's never gotten less than an A in her entire academic career, which I certainly couldn't say about myself. Uh, um, so I think hard work is part of the formula for success. Got it. Totally understood. Now, 
when it comes to looking at the, the, the marketplace today, do you see that individuals who are starting out in the real estate world, do they have it, is it easier uh, today than it was uh, for yourself? Or is it, do you see it fraught with more challenges? What, how do you perceive it to be? Uh, you know, it's, it's hard because my business has grown and is now a huge multinational uh, company. Mm -hmm. uh, we own assets in, I think, 33 American states and five countries. So obviously when you're operating on that scale, your perception is different. But my sense is that the business has changed. It's become a lot more complicated. Mm. There are a lot more issues that one has to be concerned with. Uh, there's a lot more expertise that you have to bring to bear uh, to make, make real estate work. And um, that it's really a team sport rather than an individual sport. That's not to say that somebody couldn't start out and, and take on, a, uh, you know, some smallish projects on their own. But um, to really be competitive and to do it on a more professional level, uh, I, think, uh, I think you need to be part of a group where um, that, that uh, multitude of expertise is available from colleagues. Uh, um, and also, when you go to the world, uh, you present yourself uh, as part of a, of, a, of a significant entity because a lot of people uh, who are selling buildings want to know who they're selling them to. They want to know that, uh, that there's a high uh, probability that you're going to transact. Uh, unfortunately, there are a lot of flakes in the real estate business, so um, people often find that they make a deal with somebody and they don't perform. Uh, and banks and financing institutions and uh, um, the broad spectrum of, of companies that are involved in, in real estate uh, um, want to know about your track record and credibility. So if you're young and you go to work for a company that has that kind of credibility, you sort of inherit it. Mm. If you're on your own, uh, then uh, it's, it's harder, depending on the scale of what you're doing, to make the case. So if you had an opportunity today to, to speak to, you know, someone who was in the beginning stages of their real estate career, is there something that you would tell them to do differently than things that maybe y you yourself did? Well, I think that, um, again, it, uh, if you're starting out a couple of, you know, smaller transactions and you know, you can sort of find find the financing from family, friends, those kinds of things. Uh, um, that you know, you can give it a try. But I think if if you really get into it and you really want to advance your career, um, you you have to spend time working in a sophisticated real estate environment, uh, really to learn about all of the different aspects and expertise that gets deployed around the complex questions that uh, real estate raises. Uh, and, you know, perhaps if you spend some time working there, uh, um, you can take that knowledge and then go off and start, a, start your own company or possibly partner with some friends. Um, we actually, in my company, mm -hmm. uh, we're kind of a, a hybrid Part of what we try to be is a platform for young, very talented entrepreneurs to uh, um, pursue their professional life here. And uh, they, we set it up in a way that they're really participating in it economically as well as in all other respects. And uh, um, they can sort of be entre very entrepreneurial, but off of our platform and have our have the, have the credibility of our fifty years in business to uh, to put wind in their back and uh, to get things done that that otherwise they'd have a lot of trouble doing if they were on their own. 
So it, it seems to me that, um, I mean, just based upon the short conversation that we've had today, there's a a lot of things that you care about. There's a lot that, that comes that you've experienced and have done, and, and you have a, an immense amount of things to, to share. So I'm curious to know how difficult was it for you to condense all of that and, and to put it into risk game? Well, to be honest with you, I thought it would, was it going to be impossible? <laughs> and when I was thinking about this on my own, I was thinking, well, I really got to write four different books. Mm-hmm. One about uh, um, real estate, one about publishing, one about uh, um, some, of, some of my not-for-profit activities, uh, yeah. art, uh, education, and uh, ultimately criminal justice reform. But then I met this extraordinary uh, professional writer, uh, Rebecca Paley, and uh, we decided to collaborate on it. And when I was sort of talking about, well, how are we going to deal with all these different subject areas? She said, that's my problem. I'm going to turn it into a narrative <laughs> and, uh, and I'll just tell the story. And in fact, that's what she did. And I, I think it's a pretty decent book. And certainly has resonated with a, a lot of people who who contacted me once they read it you, expressed their enthusiasm for it you know it, it seems as though that the the same skill set you employed with your father's business and what you were suggesting to him is is the skill set that you have continually used to to bring everything to market including risk game would you agree um, well, I'm not quite sure what you're alluding to, but... Uh, well, um, in the sense that, because you were suggesting to your dad that something to the effect of, let's bring in more people who could help yeah. us make this happen, and that seems to be a through line that yeah, I've very, heard you very say. Very much so. Yeah. I, I have found that uh, even in our business today, mm-hmm. in addition to the entrepreneurs who work directly off our platform, probably 40% of the transactions that we do, we do in joint venture with other real estate companies. And we do that because we find that they have expertise about their marketplace or uh, uh, um, their own experiences uh, that uh, enrich uh, us. And in combination, we're stronger than we are on our own. And uh, so... I enjoy working with colleagues and I enjoy working with other professionals, uh, whether they're part of my company or uh, uh, out on, on their own or part of other companies. So uh, at, at the risk of making an assumption here, uh, I've heard many different things in the, the business world from, you know, half hearted jokes of, you know, a partnership is the only ship designed to sink to all, well, many other things. I'm curious, uh, one, that if you've ever had something go south that was a partnership situation or something where you were relying on someone else's expertise, as you mentioned, but not so much have have you ever had that, but how did you deal with confronting any emotions or thoughts that you might have had about, okay, that happened, yet still leveraging other people's resources as part of how your business needs to grow. How did you work around the, the, what can be complicated to, to trust and, and partner again? Well, I think that's a great question. Uh, I think the answer is the same that it is in, in, in undertaking business ventures. Mm. Um, you're always going to face some failure. Uh, um, and you can't be overly discouraged by failure. You can learn from it. Um, you can try to understand things in a different way than perhaps you did in the beginning. But um, uh, um, a certain amount of, of, of failure uh, is inevitable. And that goes true uh, with partnerships uh, and with working with colleagues. There are people who are going to disappoint you. There are business partners that are going to disappoint you. Uh, On the other hand, I can tell you, even though I've had my share of of some business partners who disappointed me and some bitterly, um, 
overall, I benefited immensely more than I was hurt by the ones that didn't work out. And uh, I remember I once uh, I got a, 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 I think I bought it for my wife or something, a cup that, you know, they have those sayings on it. Mm-hmm. And the saying on this cup was, imagine what you could accomplish if you weren't afraid to fail. Imagine what you could accomplish if you weren't afraid to fail. So I think you can't get discouraged. Uh, in fact, I remember there was some other well-known entrepreneur, I can't remember who it was, and he said, look, if you're not failing in 10 or 20% of your ventures or attempts, you're not taking enough risk. So uh, I think you have to be able to dust yourself off after something bad happens and move on and not apply those negative experiences to the rest of the world. Understood. So is that why the title of the book is Risk Game? Uh, yeah. Um, as I said, uh, um, you have to be able to tolerate risk. You have to be able to accept failure, uh, learn from it, and move on. And uh, um, I've had my share of both, but overall, I'm ahead. <laughs> it's like I often say to people, you know, I don't bat a thousand in the real estate business. I probably bat around six fifty, but that's pretty good. <laughs> Understood, agreed. Understood and agreed. So, um, for those that have listened this far and want to maybe pick up a copy of the book or find out more about what you guys are up to, or maybe even understand some more of the causes that you support, what's going to be the best way for them to catch up with you and uh, find out more? Well, for sure, you can order a copy of, of, of Risk Game. Um, you could also check out uh, our websites. Uh, my real estate company uh, goes under the name Time Equities, Inc. Take a look at it. We have an extensive website, which will give you lots of ideas of what we do. Uh, in my uh, in my not-for-profit world, uh, um, there's the OMI, OMI International Arts Center, there's the Greenberger Center for Social and Criminal Justice. And uh, last but not least is New York Edge, which is an after-school program serv- servicing uh, the public schools of New York. Uh, we're the largest in New York City and I think the largest in the nation. Awesome. So as we wind down, I've got a final question for you because I'm curious to hear your answer. Um, the you know, there's a number of individuals who have listened this far and they started in one mental, emotional state, you know, and now they're at a different space, having listened to you, heard your story a little bit. And they're at what I like to call the precipice of decision. It's that point at which you finally, you know, generate the courage to to take that next step. And for some, that next step could be something as simple as, you know what, I am going to write that offer. I'm going to get into business. I'm going to take that risk. I'm going to partner again. I'm going to do whatever it is, is the next step for them. Now, you know, like I know that during those moments, we as humans, we often have a companion that joins us at the precipice of decision. Now that press, uh, that companion though, comes in the form of a voice. And it's a voice that often reminds us of why it won't work and how, who on earth do you think you are? You're, you're not capable of that. And for some people, it, they're related to that voice so my question to you is as follows let's pretend that this time it's going to be different this time they're actually going to follow through they're going to do exactly what you suggest and they're going to do so in the next 24 to 48 hours what would you suggest that they do well uh, um, uh, most people who are entrepreneurs have had dreams or ideas of, of one sort or another so I would suggest to them that they think about what they regard as their best idea, uh, then um, uh, make sure that they've analyzed it and thought about it carefully, uh, and then try to put it into action. And where they see uh, obstacles or, or challenges that have to be overcome, create devise strategies of how to overcome them. So, you know, if they're going to buy that house down the block and renovate it, well, of course, you got to have some money to do that. So figure out some friends and family who you might go to uh, to help you get, st- help you get started. Um, make sure that when you go to buy that house, you've looked at 
every house in, in the marketplace that could be a prospect and that you understand the pricing of the marketplace extremely well. I often say that uh, looking redeems uh, 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 real estate in the sense that when you look at things, uh, you'll see opportunities that people who only look at two or three things and then make a decision to buy something, uh, it's better to look at 20, 30, or 100 hmm. uh, because you'll find unusual uh, price differences and things that might make something a good buy. Uh, and I often say, buy it right, it's the only chance you'll get. <laughs> so uh, lots of careful thought and, uh, and then where there, are pro- where there are challenges, which there always are, uh, you know, sit down and strategize how to overcome them. Uh, sometimes uh, that's, you know, could be a matter of, uh, of some uh, local uh, building codes or zoning issues, you know, go talk to the town, go talk to the officials about whatever the problem is. And you may find that although it looks like an obstacle at first blush, that uh, if you understand their goals and needs, uh, you can and uh, um, come up with a plan that they might make an exception for uh, because they see it to be in the community's interest. Got so uh, for every roadblock, there's a, there's a strategy to how to succeed by uh, overcoming that roadblock, not by ignoring it, hmm. not by doing something that's improper, but by finding positive solutions to those challenges. I like it a lot. I definitely appreciate uh, the, you know everything that you that you stand for, uh, what you've been doing, the, the impact that you've had uh, on lives and individuals, and even more so now that you're you're sharing the information uh, via your your book. So uh, I just want to be one of the first to say, you know, thanks for taking the time to share your knowledge, your wisdom, and insight here with us today at the Cashflow Diary, sir. Well, and thank you, Jay, for taking the time to talk with people like me and sharing it with your listeners. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you know what time it is. It's time for you to move at the speed of instruction. What does that mean? Well, that means go pick up a copy of the book, because if you heard what I heard, you know that there's a lot more things that you can learn, will learn, should learn, need to know And most importantly, he's clearly already been there. He's already done that. And therefore, you and I can gain from the wisdom. See, there's not enough time to make all the mistakes. Might as well leverage his experience. And I don't know if you heard this, but I know that I did. While you're on the way to the bookstore or Amazon to pick it up, remember this. Imagine what you could accomplish if you weren't afraid to fail. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been fun talking to you today. I look forward to talking to you soon. Until next time. 